Hey everybody, what's going on? It is me, your host of the Podcast for the Universe, Craig. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting the show in all the ways that you do. We really, really appreciate it. And by we, I mean me and everybody else that, you know, does the podcast. So first things first, right off the bat, we have a big event coming up next month. May 13th is going to be the first ever live episode of the podcast. What that means is you'll be able to get on to Facebook, go to our Facebook page, May 13th, 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and tune in and watch the live episode happen. We're going to be recording from the Infinite Possibilities Higher Consciousness Festival, which is taking place May 12th, 13th, and 14th. It's all weekend long. We'll be there on Saturday, May 13th, recording. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a uh, like a panel roundtable discussion me, Anna Sierra, who is responsible for the festival and a slew, just endless list of amazing things. We also have Amber Lynn Rasmussen, who's going to be on the podcast that day. She is the host of another podcast called Soul Wanderings. And then uh, to be announced or determined third person <laughs> will be joining us on the podcast as well. But it's going to be a lot of fun. So go to our Facebook page. You can find the event link there for that. Um, you can also find all the information for the Infinite Possibilities Festival that's going on at our Facebook page, also on our website, energyislovepodcast.com. We've made it easy for you. Go to our website, and at the top there is a banner that you can click on, which will then take you to the event page for the live episode on May 13th, which you can then like and follow and all that kind of stuff. So then you'll be ready to go when the time comes. We're excited for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Also, next month, uh, the podcast technically is going to reach its one-year anniversary. So when I say technically, obviously, it's reaching its one-year anniversary, and we're excited. I don't know yet what we're going to do, but we're going to do something for it, because <laughs> it's been a wonderful um, year of just amazing, wonderful people that I've got to chat with and interview and visit and learn more and more and more and more about. So that's coming up next month as well. So as always, you can find all this information online, Facebook, website, everywhere, Energies Love Podcast. Thank you, guys. This episode of the podcast is brought to you, brought to you by our wonderful sponsors. First off, we have As Above, So Below, which is located in Roy, Utah. So As Above, So Below is a wonderful metaphysical shop that contains and carries and houses and holds so many, many, many amazing things. When you get into the realm of spirituality through whatever path or avenue, journey, whatever it is, when you get into that space, you start to explore, and as above, so below is a wonderful place to go and explore. They have crystals and stones, tarot cards, incense, jewelry, clothing, you name it, they've got it. It's a great place. Go check them out. Coming up on June 4th, as above, so below is going to be hosting a summer witch fest. It's going to be a day of amazingness and fun and festivities and all sorts of good stuff. So go to our website, click on sponsors, then click on as above, so below, which will take you to their Facebook page and you can see everything that they have as well as keep up to date with all that they're doing. This episode is also brought to you by Entheozen. Entheozen is a nutritional supplement company with products designed for promoting optimal brain health as well as your overall happiness. Everything that Entheozen is about and everything that they put out there, all their products are geared towards your brain and mood health. They have mood enhancement and stress support, as well as party recovery formulas. Every ingredient that they use has been scientifically studied and carries premium active forms of vitamins and minerals with the sole purpose of ensuring bioavailability and maximum absorption. Entheozen also offers educational outreach workshops and programs focused on empowering people to achieve and sustain mental wellness. One of their products, one of the things they offer is Transzen, which is a mood enhancement and can also be used as a meditation aid. So next time you go to yoga, next time you're going to sit down and practice some meditation, or maybe next time you hop into a float tank, take some Transzen and it's going to help you connect a little bit easier and expand your mind. But you can find all their information at entheozen.com. They're also available on Amazon, so if you go to Amazon and just search Entheozen, it's going to take you right to their products. And then be sure when you're going to check out to enter the promo code ENERGYIS. That's a special promo code for fans of the podcast. It's going to save you 10%. Remember, 
whether you're buying through the website or you're purchasing directly through Amazon, which is the easiest, best way to do it, in my opinion, enter that promo code energy is and save 10% on today's show on the show of this podcast that you're about to listen to. I got a chat with Mindy Wadsworth. So how I met Mindy was there is a cool shop. It's a really, really neat bookstore slash kind of metaphysical spot that has a whole bunch of stuff. It's called the Golden Braid and it's here in Salt Lake City. So I pop in one day checking out the shop and Mindy is one of their house readers. So she's there on a regular basis um, providing sessions and readings and working with clients and all that kind of stuff. And so I sat down with her and we chatted for a little bit. Super interesting person. She had a lot of really good stuff. So we set up a time in the future and we got to sit down. Mindy was nice enough to share everything on the podcast that she's experienced and gone through and her journey. And we, as always, I mean, I always say that we get into a lot of stuff, but it's kind of the fun thing about the podcast is we get into so many different things. And we did in this episode. It was absolutely wonderful. Mindy was amazing. She is amazing. You can go find her at Golden Braid. Uh, We've got all the links for everything in the show notes, obviously, and then on Facebook. But for now, folks... Thank you, Mindy, and everybody else, turn it up, sit back, relax, and enjoy this wonderful, beautiful episode of the Podcast for the Universe with my guest, Mindy Wadsworth. Here we go. You're listening to the Energy is Love Podcast. Energy is Love. The Energy is the Love Podcast. The Energy is Love Podcast. Energy is Love. The Energy is Love Podcast. The Podcast for the Universe. The Energy is Love Podcast. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. We started. Oh, hi. This is it. (laughs) (laughs) Here we are. (laughs) So, Mindy, first off, you have to tell me your last name again. I forget what your last name is. My last name is Wadsworth. Wadsworth? Mm Mm-hmm. Excellent. And we met, oh, I don't remember. I guess it's probably like a week, two weeks ago, something like that. I came and found you at the Golden Braid, and we chatted for a little bit. Correct. And I'm very excited because you have a whole bunch of stuff that I kind of want to talk to you about in regards to what you do and how you work and all those kind of different things. So first off, give everybody an idea. I always like to find out how people get to the space that they're in where, I mean, we're here at your house and you have, (laughs) as I'm looking around, you just have a ton (laughs) of stuff, a ton of amazing things here. Um, You can see that you have this whole eclectic kind of environment and energy and all these kind of different things that I can tell that you're kind of into and that you connect with, I'm sure, and all these kind of different things. So take me all the way back. Is this something that you feel like you've always been drawn to all of these type of things when it comes to spirituality and energy work and things like that? Or is it something that you kind of came to later in life? Well, I've always had a very vivid imagination since I was a child. I saw lots of things and saw I guess, spirits and colors and little creatures and little things. But um, there wasn't a lot of people that really believed me when I was younger. And so it was a really lonely journey of wondering if there was something wrong with me. Because my whole entire family, there was no one that really had that kind of gift or whatever it might be. So as I got a little bit older, like in my teenage years, I started delving into the dark arts, I guess you could say, with Ouija boards and things like that, and wondered what all this energy or this stuff was that I was seeing. And so it didn't go so well with the Ouija boards, and I don't really (laughs) recommend them, but I got to see some real dark darkness and some demons and some things that came into my life that stayed with me for a long time. And over time, I kind of would talk to people about it. This was probably when I was like, I don't know, 16, 17, and still no one had any idea. I was in the Mormon church at the time. I didn't really believe, but someone suggested that I go to the Mormon church to talk to them about it. So I did, and that was kind of my last straw where I was like, I don't know what's going on, and I tell them I see these things, and they're like, well, you must be on drugs. (laughs) That was their answer. (laughs) That was their answer, and I was like, I am most definitely not on drugs. And at that point they were like, well, here's a blessing. Like, we'll give you a blessing and, you know, let your parents know what's going on with you. And, but I just, there's no other solution because those things aren't real. So I was kind of dumbfounded and I, I took some, I didn't know really what to do. 
And so I ended up going down a path of like pharmaceutical journey and I numbed myself for probably, I don't know, six years, saw all the different psychologists, all the different things. And they told me I had everything under the sun and I got to experiment with all the medications and all the things until quite literally I'd lost all me and my memories and who I was. And people were like, you're kind of a robot. Like there's something wrong with you. There's something missing. So over time, I finally got out of it and got myself off all the medication and said, one specific doctor said to me, well, it was a new doctor and he had me tell my whole story like I'm telling here. And he goes, well, you know, what, what is it that makes you think it's not real? And I said, well, I guess just because everybody else says it's not real. And he goes, so what? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, (laughs) like this like big dawning moment. Like it is, oh, that is a real thing. Oh, okay. You know? And so he was the first one to like be like, yeah, you probably do. And that's okay. What kind of stuff were you seeing? Like, I mean, do you know what I mean? Growing up and things like that, I think kids that have very active imaginations i i did too like i could always kind of whether or not i when i think back i don't know if i necessarily saw a whole bunch of things but i could always imagine so many different things do you know what i mean it was really easy to go outside and play and have an entire kind of uh scenario or scene or everything kind of chalked up in my head and uh, i loved it it was you know i mean i still kind of have that oh good but um what was it specifically that you kind of saw that made you really question whether or not especially to go down that route where you're going to start getting, you know, treatment and things like that and get all lost in the journey of trying to drug yourself to get rid of whatever it is that you're seeing and experiencing. Um, We lived in, up in the mountains, up in the Uinta Mountains and um, in a place called Pioa in Oakley. It's like Camas Valley. And that, that valley is really, there's a lot of like Native American old, spirits and lots of things that happened up there different kinds of massacres of some sort and just all sorts of things and a lot of the stuff I saw where I lived was like of that realm like we had a big thing that looked like a dire wolf I guess you could say but it was an energy spirit that not only I saw there was actually one more person that did see that thing and it would run across this gate every time you'd come in at the night and your whole car would get cold and you'd see this big thing go like Okay. (laughs) And driving down this canyon where lots of people died in this canyon, I'd always see like it would look like people were running out in front of my car or like, but they were spirits. But I couldn't decipher like, am I going crazy? No one's seeing these things, you know? So I'm thinking I'm going to hit somebody, but it's some like troubled soul or something. Yeah. And uh, a lot of a big thing that happened is playing with a Ouija board with a couple of girlfriends of mine or actually one girlfriend in particular. And we really tempted the devil and we, we asked for the spirit to come or whatever it was. And she ended up being possessed by this spirit, like entered her body and had never seen anything like that happen. And to this day she won't talk about it, but it really like came in into her and started doing these strange drawings and like, she was definitely not her, you know, she was very checked out. And, um, and after that time, there would always be something like talking to me a lot too. So I heard things a lot, like telling me different things and showing me images of things that people were doing. I could start seeing through the walls at my house. Like it was very bizarre. I had no idea what was going on. So I just kind of lay in my room and look around and have that experience of going like what is happening to me were you like were you talking to your parents about all this kind of stuff too or were they much help or yeah they just were like oh whatever we don't see anything i don't know what you're talking about there's nothing here there's and i'm like i really do you know and yeah like no that's no just they, kind of pawned it off on to. kids being kids yeah. <laughs> so i think it was a lot of that because it was more like tortured stuff that i would see or they'd show me things that weren't really i didn't want to see but friends doing things to me behind my back or so it it was good information but at the time I felt tortured to get this kind of information and be right about it and I'm like how can you see me right now you know like I don't know (laughs) (laughs) so that was the darker side of it I guess and not understanding is really lonely I think it's pretty common when it comes to 
um, when I say pretty common, but I think it's one of those things where people start to have those, where they start to see things and they start to hear things where a lot of times it will get chalked up to some sort of mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia or your bipolar mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. And I always think it's an interesting thing because I've, like I've talked with a lot of people that have schizophrenia. I, you know what I mean? I've dealt with people that have like super chronic mental illness mm-hmm. and they will see things and they will hear things obviously. And they will have those type of uh, experiences. And in my own journey, in my own experience, I've come to kind of this place where I think that, um, boy, I don't know. I don't know how to label and labels a bad way to describe it. But I think when it comes to mental illness, I think we all fall on the spectrum in one way, shape or form. And I think when people get to the point, you know, on that spectrum where they do start to see and hear things, I don't necessarily think it's just, uh, I don't think it's a mental illness. I don't think it's something that is, um, happening to them or whatever. And got your cat over there playing. (laughs) He's like, I want to be on the podcast. (laughs) But I don't think it's, like I said, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's, I think the reality of it is they're probably, for whatever reason, open to whatever's going on and whatever's happening. Now, does that mean that everything that they experience is really happening and really true? I don't, you know, I don't know, but I think that a lot of the things that they do go through and experience are probably, do you know I mean, they're connected to some other realm or some other dimension and getting information and seeing things and, because we all do that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we all experience that. So why is it if I have that experience, you know, I'm not going to be classified as schizophrenic, but somebody else that does maybe just because they have it more frequently. But what do you think? Like, do you think that if you went through that process of going to counselors and psychologists and getting treatment and all these type of different things, did you have that thing after a while where you started to really question if maybe you were like crazy in a sense? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely did. I just, I couldn't find the answers because I'd looked for so long and I couldn't find anyone like me or speak to anyone like me. And so in my experience, it was very lonely and there wasn't like hope, you know, or I wouldn't have ever gone off the deep end and like got on all these medications and been like, oh yeah, you're schizophrenic, you're bipolar, you're depressed. Oh, now you have anxiety. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Let me give you four more pills. <laughs> and you know, it got to a point where like some of the pills I took made me want to kill myself. It was just like really dark times. And I was like, how is this okay? And how is this helping anyone? Um, I did want to add something that you were talking about, the mental illness. And, and later in life, I realized after I, you know, came out of it and was like, no, I'm just going to like explore my gifts. <laughs> That sounds more fun. <laughs> but there was a, a couple teachings that I had read about in um, different tribes and communities that they don't believe in mental illness. And anyone that has things like that, they take them and they train them and they like work with them and they don't put them in the dark. And they say, oh, OK, well, you must be having a gift come to you and you must be having like you're a medicine person for us. And now we're going to work with you and train you and like help you m- manage your gifts and help you help others through that. Because you're able to see in these different realms and you're able to help through that way. And I feel like this country looks at it completely different. And there's a lot of troubled people that I've met because of that instance where they think they are crazy. And there really isn't a lot of help and stability, especially for youth. I think now they're a little bit smarter and they know that it's that um, I've been meeting some people at the Golden Braid, honestly, yeah. some young people that embrace their gifts and they know and they they know that other people don't have them but they still are okay with it and they know that it's real they keep it a little more quiet but i i that's a good thing probably but i think the reality is too that it probably like in the country as a whole and in our society here and in the states and everything like that and not even in america but you know in western civilization as a whole I think mental illness still gets a terrible rap and it's still something that people don't talk about and that we want to not look at and shun people that, you know, because we don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea of the tribal thing where we're going to look at it in a different way, in a different light. I think that would probably serve us a lot, a lot better. Very much. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you transition? How did you go from, you know, I'm going to start exploring these things and learning about them. What was that like? Um, let's see. My journey was through nature. I did the whole American dream, bought a house, did this whole 
experience, worked for my family's construction company and just never felt right. Like I never felt like I was fulfilling what I needed to do. And so one day I kind of said, can I swear on you? Yes, you can swear oh, away. Perfect. I said, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I moved to uh, California onto a weed farm where I lived in the middle of nature, very far from like off the grid, lived on solar power um, and was outside. I lived in a van and it was a complete opposite switch. But I started watching nature and I started seeing everything in nature and started like communing with the birds and seeing like, oh, I built this like magical place with these crystals and now these fairies came and I see fairies and like, what's going on? You know, this is a really interesting new perspective and going to these places that I don't even know. It's like going to Wonderland, these just beautiful trees and these beautiful, it's like in Redwood country, but it's where they cut down a lot of the redwoods where I was. And so it's all like old oaks and big Douglas firs and just right on the, um, called the Emerald Triangle. So there's a lot of energy. It's like almost an energy portal. So you find these trees that like whisk you away to where you sit in them and time disappears or just very strange things that I had never experienced on a real level to where it's kind of like, am I crazy again? You know, (laughs) but there's other people up there that have the same experiences and that's where it opened up is that they've lived in that for years. And so, There was finally someone to be like, yes, that's what's happening to you. Yes, you are really tapped in. Like, you can see that. That's amazing. And so I started working with somebody up there. She does this, um, it's called soul retrieval. And started working a little bit in like past life and soul things and seeing like why I had different gifts or why I was connected to people. And that work opened my eyes, I guess, to the fact that like there's a lot of people everywhere that have this. And so then I felt more comfortable exploring and sharing with everyone up there. And when I came back to Utah, that was a little bit different. Cause it's then, a big reality yeah, check. Yeah, <laughs> it's a big reality check. And people are like, you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you sit in the portal in a tree? Hmm. <laughs> okay, so you're going to the mental hospital. Okay. You know, but I just, I knew in my heart that, no, this time I know it's real. And like this time I know, whatever, you don't have to believe me. I don't care. You know, I know that this started happening. And so that's when I started really exploring my own dreams and my own psyche and my own um, experiences and writing them down and really like mapping what each day was like and how the moon was affecting me and started learning about magic and reading books about magic by Aleister Crawley and just really exploring these things that I never dove deeply into because I was afraid and that's when I felt very called to start sharing my gifts and making medicines and making like using crystals and creating little special pieces with them. And everything I created had a magical purpose or like the feathers from the birds that that I would find would mean something specific. And then I could give that to someone and it would give them that energy. And I finally understood how it all was connected and how we can connect with nature and really like learn through nature. And so then I started working with it and making things for people and um, then started studying tarot at that point for myself do you still question it like are there times in the process you know even at this point where do you still sit back and think because I, th- I do this all the time where i talk to a lot of people for the podcast i have all these experiences myself and uh the way that i kind of work with energy and all these type of different things and i still go to that space sometimes where i think that it's all just in my head that it's all imagination that i'm all do you know what i mean mm-hmm. just completely uh in my own little fantasy land yeah I've I've definitely, I think um, I've done some psychedelic drugs in my day and I think that's helped me like really see that reality or, or really feel, sometimes it can make you be more crazy, but really see kind of the same things on the same drug each time I would do it. And so then I kind of really start understanding like almost the sacred geometry of the planet or like the different the different levels and the different things I would see continuously, like my my measure of proof is like it happens a few times. Or yeah. like sometimes if something new comes in or whatever, then I have to have that experience maybe a few times before I truly fully believe it to see the proof. 
because I know that beliefs can really play into our brains too and like what we believe we see and so to it's it's also a challenge there too (laughs) but like for the most part because of from working at the golden braid and being able to tap into that source energy all the time and have the experience of the other person be so like oh wow that's wow how did you know how did you get that like i'm amazed right now kind of thing over and over it's like yeah, I really do need to trust what I hear and what I see because I have, I mean, I have not told someone something that came through when I was reading for them and it ended up happening and I felt really bad, but I wasn't absolutely for sure, you know, it's like that doubt right there. And then I still see that and I don't think she comes back to me anymore because of it, you know, yeah. because I didn't say what I wanted to say because she just like was broken. I was like, I can't say that to her right now, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> it's a hard thing in that space when you're working with somebody, mm-hmm. especially when it's really shitty stuff that comes up because mm-hmm. you're like, I, like you said, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to say this. How do you say this to the person in the moment when they're you know what I mean? Going through so many different things and it's a challenging thing to do, but I think it's an important thing to do. Mm-hmm. And not just when you're sitting down reading somebody's cards or no. whatever, but I mean, we have that all the time in regular, you know, relationships and things like that, where you mm-hmm. have to talk about the crappy stuff, even when it's yep. not fun. Exactly. That's how we learn and how we grow. And I was going to ask you, oh, <laughs> one of the things that I think as well, so I, I mean, all these things that we're talking about, some, it's a perfect podcast for it because obviously people that listen to this podcast are into this type of shit. But for me, I always think too that regardless of whether or not, like I talked about how sometimes I worry that it's just all in my imagination that I'm making it up. But in the process of doing that or like in my own experience in life and the way that I would work with and see energy, I just came to the point where I realized that regardless of whether or not it's my imagination, it's still real. Mm-hmm. And so, cause I think that that's how our imagination works. I think when we get into the space of creating things in our head and thinking crazy thoughts and all those type of things that happen when you kind of sit down and imagine, I think that is connected to some source of energy where like free, free flowing thought exists mm-hmm. and creation and all that kind of stuff. So even though I might think it's crazy or maybe cause I've talked to people before too, that are like way out there in the things that they think and believe and I think okay that's wonderful but yeah at the end of the day I come back to that place where I think okay it's real for them so it's real it doesn't I don't have to pick it apart much further than that correct yeah it's um it's so true that whole thing our our creation you know our creation in our brain is so powerful when we push it out and especially if we feel it that's the most important I think like our our heart emanates these these vibrations and these frequencies. So if we really think something and then we truly feel it and believe it, that's kind of the the belief thing that it does create something in front of us. And it does show us something from exactly our own brain. But sometimes we want to separate from, Oh, I didn't create that, you know, (laughs) when we don't like what, what happens, but it's so very true. Yeah. (laughs) We always end up creating (laughs) it regardless either (laughs) way. Um, what else? Cause I looked online and all the different things that you do, you have a whole bunch of, um, like I can see the, uh, not the, uh, uh, my goodness. The logo back there. The logo. That's the word oh, I was Amare looking for. Warriors. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. So the past two years I did a festival called Amare, um, a festival in the first one was in the desert the second one was in the woods but it's a lot about connecting to nature having some fun workshops and things of people that will teach different movement classes different like one time some business tactics money things um plant medicines art creation it's all about it was all about creating things and having um like music and celebration and Some people have been to festivals or whatnot, um, that kind of vibe, but, uh, I want, I wanted to create a vibe of community and community helping each other and family and kids coming together and playing and learning the same things. And we're all having the same kind of experience where we're very connected and try to share food together and do different things that bond us together. So creating a community 
that focuses on love and helping each other and and you've been doing it for the last two the years stuff. i did it the last two years this year i'm still unsure <laughs> 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 I want to redesign it a little bit so it's not so like festy, festivaly, and um, have a little, a little bit more information offered, and maybe a smaller, smaller amount of people, so it can be even more connected. Because a lot of the time, I found at the festivals, it's there's a lot of interesting energy that I'm not quite sure that I want to bring into like a family setting and. While drugs are fantastic and great and and that, it, it can get, the vibe is just not exactly what I'm looking for to take my four-year-old to, you know? See, I think that this happens a lot of times, whether it's like a, like an outdoor event or a festival or something that takes place over the course of a weekend or something like that, or even big, big events like Burning Man or whatever the case may be. And even on the small scale, small scale where it's like, um, you know, just a day event at some convention center or something like that. I think that the energy that gets created in those type of events, it's wonderful. First off, there's, you know, it's beautiful, good stuff. But I think that it tends to people that gravitate towards those type of events and people that go to those events and all those type of things that happen. I think that they get stuck in that place where we all just want to dance around in love and light and happiness and you know embrace the all the good energy that is existing but at the same time we're not doing anything with it like we're just there playing and and it's good and there's nothing Mm -hmm. wrong with it but i think that there needs to be more one of the biggest things that i think is an issue as well is it attracts those type of people right and those type of people are wonderful i'm not you know but for me i think that in the space of the new age community and spirituality and things like that if we all just stayed around in our own little circles of wonderful light and love and heart chakras opening up, um, I think there's a, oh, I always get stuck because I don't want. <laughs> I know what you mean. I watched my words very carefully. <laughs> um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think it's kind of bullshit. And I think that if we want to help people and we want to change the world, like we all just can't sit and dance in our circles of love and light and happiness we have to reach people outside of that Mm -hmm. we can't just manifest them coming because like you said i mean they sound like beautiful events Mm -hmm. but people on the outside are going to look in and unless they're in that space and they're looking for those type of things they're going to think it's just a bunch of crazy hippies out in the desert and i think that we have to do more as a as a whole to reach people that aren't necessarily attracted to it because at the end of the day, if you can get somebody into that energy in some way, shape, or form, that's when they can start to shift and change and open up and see things. Absolutely. I've wanted it to bridge the gap, and I haven't been able to find... I've had people come on my team that are like, oh, yeah, I'm really good at bridging the gap, and then they kind of fall away. So it hasn't been the time yet, which is... That's okay, you know? But how do you bridge that gap? It's it's finding... It's almost like in the language and then in the it's not formatted as a foo fooey event thing it's more like finding a a normal everyday way that like people would interact like maybe like a role play kind of thing or some i don't know i'm still trying to figure it it's out so as damn you can hard, see huh? yeah because it's like i'm not sure but i know that there's ways to like my idea was like I would love to in like get it set up where it's this beautiful like retreat there's not a drugs there's like it's really like luxurious and beautiful and um and then have like invite um like world religious leaders like this has always been my idea of bridging the gap is because a lot of our different communities follow big religions or follow these things. So if we can find our commonalities between these big groups and say, well, hey, yeah, you might believe this differently, but this is how it fits in our world here. And this, this is, it's the same thing. If we can show them that it's the same thing, we all want to help each other and we all want to like be there for each other and support families in our community or whatever it might be that we're looking to do. You get them on board, and then they're able to convey that message to the masses. And so it's it's almost finding those people of power that have that power 
to to find what you have in common with them to then have them really feel on board with your mission and co-create together. Yeah. And I think that's the only way, really. I think a lot of it has to do with language, like you said. Like, it's the mm-hmm. way that, not necessarily the way that you put it out there or kind of, you know, the, the front that you use to reach people, but the way that you articulate. Because if we were going to take just the simplest idea and concept of, like, um, I'm trying to think. Like, just something simple, like a, like a technique or something like that that you would do. Like, if we're all going to sit in meditation or sit in ceremony, in a sense, and the energy that gets created in that, right? Because that's something that would typically happen at, like, a festival or something like that, where you're going to create that space. How do we describe that in such a way where people aren't turned off at it, where it's not like we're um, masquerading it as something different, and then they get up there and they realize that we're, you know, they have to sit in a circle with a bunch of people and hug it out. <laughs> but how do you describe something like that? Because at the end of the day, everybody's had that feeling at some point in their life where you feel incredibly close, not just connected with the people around you, but connected to something else that exists. And so it's like, how do we tailor something like that or mm-hmm. describe it and label it in such a way that it's not going to turn somebody off and they will be able to get into that space and then feel that. And I don't know. I haven't come up with the answer. Like my, this podcast is the answer for me where it's like trying to take all of this shit that we talk about and all these crazy ideas. And you mentioned fairies earlier and all these mm-hmm. kind of wonderful things that I believe in that I think are real and that exist. And then have somebody else tune in and listen and be like, okay, what they're talking about is bullshit. I'm not hearing that part, but then there's something else that resonates and connects with them that hopefully they can open up and hear and listen to. But it's hard. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I think I know a part of it. I think I, excuse me, I feel like nature is our connection that's interconnected through every single human and everything here. And it, that's how I learned and how I was so, I guess, awoken was through nature and through like just hanging out all the time outside and watching how it it grows and changes and shifts and, and the, the, just how animals interact. And it's like you can, any, everyone can find peace in the forest if they sit down, you know? Well, I think it's a big one. I mean, I think it's a great way to go because almost everybody, you know, likes being outdoors, likes Mm -hmm. nature. I mean, there's, there's people that don't, but at the end of the day, even the people that don't like it, they, I think they can inside know what that feeling is when you do go outside, when you do get up into the mountains or, do you know what I mean, sitting on the beach or something like that and watching the ocean and you have a sense of what that feels like. Mm-hmm. And I think that is universal. I think that it is something that everybody feels regardless. Absolutely. I, I think meditation is uh, one of those things too that's kind of bridging the gap where um, like yoga is a really good example where yoga went through this whole transition, I think probably over the last 20 or 30 years where it became much more mainstreamed and now it's so commonplace and so accepted, but at the core of what yoga is and the teachings and the traditions and, do you know what I mean, the practice Mm -hmm. of yoga dates back centuries. And so I think meditation is one of those things that people are starting to, it's starting to bridge that gap where people who aren't crazy hippies or monks or in the spiritual community or want to sit out in nature and meditate, they're practicing meditation in some way, shape, or form and realizing the benefits of it. And so maybe it's just a a retreat that we don't call a retreat that's out in nature that's focused on meditation. And through that, I don't know. It's a good idea. (laughs) That's the only thing I've found that we have all in common, 100%. We can't deny. Like, trees are awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Most people like trees, you know? Like, that's always kind of my base. Like, we're all like trees. We have roots. We need to take our nutrients. Then we grow and then we flower. And then after we take everything we need, then we're able to give fruit or give shade or whatever it might be. Like we're very much like trees, you know? Yeah. Every human. We need all those things to survive. Um, oh, there was something I was going to say. I forgot. It was something on the that. nature. I know. I was like, oh, wait. Oh, oh. <laughs> It is easy to see in nature how everything's interconnected and then... Oh, I know. I know what I was going to say. Okay. So 
I was doing a little bit of research on like who has the longest lifespan in in the on the planet and who's lived the longest and why, you know? And it's Japan, which shocked me because it's so small and there's so many people on such a small space. But one of the things that they talk about and they've always been very connected to nature and plants and all of that is they do this thing and it's called forest bathing. And they, like I said, like you go and sit in the forest. They like literally go and not hike, but they sit in the forest and let themselves commune with the forest and watch things and just listen and observe. And that's their connection to source and that's their connection to calming and like no stress. And and they have all that technology around them all the time and like all of that, but yet they tend to have found some way to live the longest, you know, in one of the most unlikely circumstances. So I find that pretty fascinating. So that, I do too. That's a really interesting thing. How do we take that though? Like, what do we do with that? How do, cause I'm sitting here thinking about all the different ways that, um, cause I, I think that it's so important to reach more people. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? To get outside of the circle. So Golden Braid, we talk about Golden Braid. It's a cool little bookstore here in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. They do a bunch of different things there. And then they have house readers and you're one of the house readers that's there throughout the week and things like that. Correct. But um, how do you get more people to... I, I just... I don't know why we're. I'm stuck on this, but like, I feel like how do we get more people drawn to these things and connected to these things? a mystery (laughs) i'm still trying to figure it out too you know i mean my my common thing keeps being nature but i don't know how to get them there or i don't know how to show them or prove them to things or whatever it might be you know i find that i really have always loved gandhi's motto like be the change you wish to see in the world and so as much as i can i share that with every person you know about nature and like how important it is and Like here now we get to talk to a little bit more people and each time it's like going, it it is rippling, you know? And, and I think that if we focus on each interaction we have with someone and being able to share those things, if appropriate, triggers in them something that is a reminder or like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And then they'll share that with someone else because when they do it, they notice, wow, I really feel different when I go take a walk every day, like outside and look around it's pretty amazing you know oh then they tell their friend like yeah i've been doing this new thing it's walking <laughs> and I, like look at the birds and like the grass is growing it's amazing have you noticed there's dandelions <laughs> outside you know like all of a sudden and I, uh, that's the best i can do <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a good point, start you know it's a good thing <laughs> and i feel like ripple effects they take a long time but we're doing everything that we we know how to do right now Unless we can get like a YouTube channel of like 50 million followers for being really funny. And like, I think that's a lot is video and Mm -hmm. like imagery and being able to tap into showing people worldwide on the internet. And that's the coolest like technology thing that we have. I kind of stay out of technology and off the computer myself, but I do find that it's, it's a great way to connect value. And yeah, like I wouldn't have known that forest bathing thing you know it like popped up on facebook and i was like whoa i didn't even realize that you know that's Mm -hmm. so neat and i wouldn't have known that otherwise and so the that information that we have is our biggest connection to changing and shifting it's just what images do we show people or what you know it's like we just think of the president and the presidential like debates and how much they create people to think and like talk. And it's like, people love drama, you know? So yeah. if we can create like a drama show around it or something <laughs> like <laughs> that's, I think how to reach the most people. So tell me, cause you also do, um, plant medicine stuff and you make things and the whole apothecary stuff, right? Mm-hmm. First off, tell people exactly, like describe as best you can what the hell an apothecary is for people out there that may not I mean, it, like when I initially think of that word, it seems very old and it mm-hmm. seems very dated back to the time where, you know, somebody would have a uh, wizard's hat on and be making things <laughs> yeah. in the, 
basement and so give me an idea of what it is for people out there well i i feel like i use the word apothecary just because it fits like maybe i did it a long time ago in another life i have mentors of old mentors that i've read books on and that's what they called it i guess and so it does sound witch doctory <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's basically taking plant compounds and nature and different different roots and flowers and plants and um, communing with the plant, quite honestly, and feeling what that plant does. And each one will correlate to a body part that we have. And it's also on a like grander, like micro macrocosm is like showing us how we are made of everything. And so also we can use what's around us to move things out of our bodies or help us uh, with whatever we might need. It's like using the earth around us. It gives everything we need. And so through this journey, I've been able to see like the plants around where we live and pick those plants and say, oh, this one does this and kind of correlate to what it does in nature, to what it does in my body. And so I've taken lots of those knowledges and from other people and, and whatnot and then created medicines that would fit, you know, this region. So I like take some things that I find here and like, oh, we have this inversion and we have this stuff and lots of people have respiratory stuff. So I'm really going to focus on the plants that heal our respiratory system, which mullein like grows everywhere. It's almost um, like a, people wouldn't even know like a weed or whatnot, but that somehow it's like fuzzy it represents our lungs with all its little like hairs and things so you smoke it or you put it in tea or whatever and it actually pulls stuff out of your body like pulls that out of your lungs and so there's so much correlation when you pay attention to what the plant looks like what part of the plant and what part of your body and what it does to your body works and so apothecary i guess is an outdated thing but it's really like plant medicine or I don't know what else to call it to make it sound <laughs> like, you know, homeopathic. Because it's not really that either. It's like I use the actual plant stuff. I'm not turning it into little pills. And, mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, is it something that you use just for you and yourself? Or have you been able to expand it and help other people with it and outside of just like friends and family and things like that? I've definitely... Um, have quite a few clients that come anytime they have something come up, any kind of illness or um, pneumonia, all sorts of things that I've been able to help people get over real quickly with the plants that I've made. Um, I used to travel around in farmer's markets and sell my medicines there. At this point in time, I'm at the Golden Braid and I'm not doing that anymore. And so I have my apothecary here and I just tell my clients kind of word of mouth, like if if you're into that kind of thing, like I really am good at what I do and it can make you anything for anything, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be something wrong with you. Like if you want to improve your memory or your brain function <laughs> or, you know, you want to get your brain activated more or whatever that might be. And on a whole other side, uh, medicine journeys and different things like that, I can help people facilitate and do things that are a little bit more risque or like prohibition, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that, though, because you mentioned earlier, too, that you had some uh, experience with psychedelics back in the day and things like that. I think one of the things that is probably a commonly held misconception is that anything that you experience in a trip after taking something is going to be false or fake or some sort of manipulation of... Um, do you know what I mean? Reality in a sense where it's not going to be truth. It's going to be uh, tainted by whatever substance you've taken. Mm -hmm. What have you experienced and found to be like, because in my experience, and it's been very, very limited, but also my understanding in the way that I've talked to a lot of people and different things like that is that it just enhances what's already there, obviously, and what's, what's real and true. What's, what's been your experience? I find that very much. Um, that the experience carries over into my life when the drug is worn off in a way that I'm, I'm able to see some connection that I could never see before because my brain couldn't think that in that dimension. There's like 
nine or ten different perspectives you can see anything from, you know, and we don't even think about that. We think of like two most of the time. And so it's always brought my brain to that space where like all of a sudden all these things that I'd been fighting or dealing with all finally make the connection in my brain and go, oh, that's why this ding, 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 ding. And then it completely makes sense. And then I share my experience with whoever those things were going on with and like what I come up with and what happens. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, then they feel that. And so there's a validation in what I've learned through someone else that didn't even have the experience with me, but that was connected into my brain in some way or whatever troubling thing there was with that person or whatever it might be that gets figured out because of it. And so that's where my truth lies in like, okay, it's not messing me up. It's actually helping me like connect all of the dots that I can't physically see because my brain isn't that trained and it works so fast. Like I need to open up those synapses more often than not to get it all to fit together because sometimes I just get stuck with so much information all the time. Like it's insane. <clears throat> and it's not something that I recommend doing every day or you know, it's like definitely special occasion kind of things in my case or, oh yeah, I'm going to have this journey and I'm going to like set it up with these people and we're going to have this experience and we're going to all really like learn a lot about whatever it is or we're going to go play, but we're all going to play together and be in the same world together. And so when we get out of the experience, we're all able to s relate on a non-drug level of like, wow, that, you know, that really happened and that really did. And now we can talk about it. It wasn't just in my brain. You saw it too. And so that brings a more real feeling to what you experience and to integrating it because it's not just your experience anymore. And I find that group work is really powerful in that way, facilitated in the right direction. You yeah. know, it can go wrong. <laughs> like anything else. Like anything else. But I found that was those experiences to be the most powerful and beautiful I've ever had. What do you feel like outside of just giving you, um, cause I think in this space sometimes in meditation or in some sort of like dream, like, uh, like in the space, some at times where I feel like I'm getting information or I'm receiving information or I'm tapped into some place where I get shit. Right. Um, a lot of times I can take that information and correlate it and throughout my life and see where it applies. And three months later, it has some massive, um, relevant, relevance, relevance. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. <laughs> um, do you find that in that space with it's, if you go there using some sort of psychedelic, is it the same effect that it will have? Rev I don't know why I can't say relevance. <laughs> relevance. It will have relevance or is it more or less just being in that space that feels good? Does that make sense? Like, are you bringing information back that is actually applicable and helpful and progressing you in your life in such a productive way? Or is it just dancing in that space of good stuff? I think it's a little of both. Um, not that there's anything wrong with no, dancing no, in a good space. Not I mean, at it's all. It's very beneficial. It is a little of both because there's sometimes when I'll just like, it's almost like if I have to get drunk. I don't get drunk very often, but when I really get stuck and I can't let go of something... I get completely obliterated with the purpose of being like, I don't give a fuck about anything. And it's it's like an underlying subconscious thing. I know that I need to do that to let go of what's going on and figure it out. But it's also just like a complete surrender of like, I don't give a fuck anymore. I'm just going to get fucked up this day and fuck, you know. And so there's that aspect too where I just give up and say, I'm just going to have a great time and then something will come of it. Or there's the other aspect of like, when I take the medicine and I say, okay, this is like, I've designed this because I'm stuck and I can't get out of whatever this mind game is that I'm in right now. What am I missing? I'm going to take this and say, this journey is specifically to find out what I'm missing. And within that journey, if I try too hard to like figure it out, then I kind of mess up the space of the playfulness of what's going on. And so I very much also have to surrender to the moment and whatever's going on and kind of so that's why I mean a little of both because if you're not yeah. able to surrender to what's going on and you're trying to control it because you want to get something out of it you're going to really mess your brain up <laughs> <laughs> like it messes you up you know yeah <laughs> do you have any experience where 
this is kind of a hard, not hard, but it's kind of a tricky thing. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain it the right way. Because you did mention earlier back in the day when you were younger and things like that and playing with Ouija boards and everything like that. And I have this very, it's probably, I don't know how well accepted it is in the sense, I don't know if people necessarily agree. I know a lot of people don't agree with the idea. On some level they do. Um, but I think that for me, there's not a negative thing out there. There's not um, a dark side. There's not energy or magic or some deep spirit or dark spirit. or There's nothing like that for me. I don't believe in that aspect of it. And so when I think about um, negative energy or entities or bad spirits or whatever the case may be, I think that that's always the perception that we're placing upon it. That's always the thing that we're choosing to label whatever that vibration or whatever that energy may be. But in reality, from the perspective that I sit at or from the way I view it, it it's not. It's just all the same. Mm -hmm. We just call it, label it, see it differently. But if you've had really shitty, dark experiences with stuff that feels terrible, then how do you make peace with that? Mm, I see what you're saying. I think it's, it is just what you're saying, like a matter of perspective. And it takes time to see that whole picture of like, if I didn't see and experience those things that I did, I would have never even known that I had any gifts or whatever. My perception of it, because I didn't understand what it was, was what caused it to be bad. I put that on that, you know, like, oh, this is a, this is a scary experience. This is a bad experience. This is scary. This is this and this is this. Well, if I look back on it now, knowing what I know now, I see that it's not, it's not quite as terrible and I wouldn't have felt the way that I felt back then to see dark, so to speak, dark energies or dark spirits or tormented souls or whatever it might be. It it all is that like belief structure. Our beliefs are so powerful that they really make whatever is in front of us what we think. It's a hard question. <laughs> it, it is like I it's get challenged like... <laughs> by it all the time. I recently had a conversation with somebody and they were talking about this incredibly tragic thing that had happened where there doesn't appear to be any rhyme or reason to it, right? Somebody mm -hmm. was killed and there's no explanation as to why something like that had to happen. Like when you look at it yeah. from the outside, it's just a terrible, tragic thing that was way fucked up. Mm -hmm. What's the point of that, right? That has to have some like that's, you know, like the manifestation of evil, like something like that happening. And in my mind, no, it's not like it's always, there's always reasons and always explanations mm -hmm. and there's always multiple reasons for things that happen. And in my opinion, they're always good. Like, I don't think that there's bad that exists in the universe. I think there's only good. I think there's only love. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's another side. So I don't think that there's light and dark. I don't think that there's yin and yang. I don't think that there's good and evil. I think it's all good. I think that we have just mm -hmm. completely fucked up and misconstrued so many different things over the course of history that we had to label it in some way, shape, or form. And I don't know why. I don't know if it was like back in the day we had to have a way to control people and the people in power had to control people or whatever the case may be. But for me, it's just all good. And mm -hmm. it's if if I'm seeing something bad or if I'm viewing something that I am labeling bad, then I think it's much more a reflection of my current state of mind and where I'm at emotionally and how I'm thinking about myself and my life and my experiences mm -hmm. as opposed to just seeing the good in everything. But I know that there's a lot of people that think that that's just naive, that it, you mm -hmm. know, that people are, and you know, that we all are just dancing out in the woods in a ceremony and happy and happy and high as shit and we're oblivious to the realities of life. What do you, I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, you know, it's, I find that with some clients, you know, it's like they're viewing whatever their experience is, is so horrible and so awful. And I mean, I had one woman who hated her job so badly that she quite literally subconsciously created a brain disease so she didn't have to do her job anymore. That's how bad she hated it. And when she came in and I was like, you, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and she was really mad. Like, she, like, almost walked out on me. She was like, how can you say such a thing? And, you know, and I, like, 
had to keep like showing her like look what you've created like you hate your like you're sitting here telling me you hate your life and you hate your job and like you hate all these things and you don't know how to get out and then all of a sudden you create this like brain trauma or this brain thing going on and I'm like I'm looking in your eyes and I I'm very clear that you're not confused and the things that you're saying to me about you not being able to make sense of things aren't real because you're having this conversation with me and you're very coherent, you're very intelligent, you're very smart. So you're smart enough to create your own prison. Like you've built your own prison. And she was like, what? You know, like, <laughs> you're, I'm going to be fine? Like, yeah, you're great. You know, there's nothing absolutely at all. You're just subconsciously creating a way out because you're so miserable you don't know logically how to get out without having this big experience to make it real and i haven't seen her come back yet i hope that she's fantastic but <laughs> she left like a whole new person and like oh it's just a matter of perspective like our brains are so very powerful that we can really create that and i create it for myself all the time but i know because i get to practice telling people like you're in prison? Okay, that's your own prison. You know, like you're very responsible for that. You got yourself into that mess. You definitely are able to get it out and live in paradise if you so choose. Like every moment, it's like, I'm not waiting to go to heaven. I'm not waiting to go to hell. I'm not worried about that. Like my heaven is the moment that I'm in and being fully present in that moment and having that. That's immortality to me, I guess. And like, that's heaven i'm not trying to wait to go to somewhere to have it it's right here in front of my eyes <laughs> that's good so it's a really easy um initially it's a really easy concept and i think that even the people that are outside of the realm of like spirituality and all these kind of different concepts and ideas that they do to some extent feel that we create our own reality and then the question always is because it, it's easy like it's really easy to see mm -hmm. how we manifest and how we create and how a shift in perspective will change everything. Mm -hmm. So then why the hell do we f just suck at it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like why the hell is it so challenging and so difficult for people, you think? I think it has a lot to do with our belief structures. And our belief structures come from our parents and our parents' parents and it's kind of passed down in like how you see things or how you how you view things. And, and so when all of a sudden something that they didn't teach you comes into your, your life or your experience, it's, it's almost like you have to deny your own upbringing or your own existence or, or your own way that you were taught to see the world. You have to actually set that completely aside and that can cause like, it's like, but what does that make everything I did? not right or not was I just viewing it all wrong you know kind of thing and that scares the shit out of people I feel I'm sure there's other factors too but that is really the common factor that I see throughout speaking to people and having them go oh oh yeah that was like I did believe that because my mom taught me that or like I did believe that I acted this way because of that and you just follow this 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 protocol and you follow this and you'll be fine but i don't feel fine and so i'm confused it's a, it's like a loss of identity i think it just challenges so many of those like foundational beliefs that we are based on mm -hmm. i would agree i think so i think that, like the part that doesn't make sense to me and because i always we learn new things all the time right mm -hmm. and there's so many different aspects of moving through life and learning new things and new skills and if somebody shows you a better way to do something, you don't, sometimes people are assholes and they deny it and they're like, nope, this is the way to do it. But a lot of times we're open to that where we can accept that. But yet at the same time, like if we could all just accept that not only do we create our own realities, but that we can change it, you know, very, very quickly where mm -hmm. it's, you know, a lot of times it's that whole concept of like instantaneously it changes and then it's just a matter of you catching up to that change and realizing it but I, I mean i don't know i wish that there was some way to 
I think maybe we've gotten so far away from things in, over the course of history and time where we have to have almost instant gratification, like we have to have that thing in front of us right right away in order for us to really say, yes, that's what happens, right? Because mm -hmm. it makes me think about nature, like how ever-evolving and changing nature is and all of the things that take place over the course of time in nature take time. Mm -hmm. but yet they have massive repercussion and change, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what the answer is either. I'm, for whatever reason, we're talking about a bunch of shit that we don't have answers for, and that's great, I guess. But <laughs> I don't have the answers for everything. <laughs> I think a lot of it is the process of people won't slow down enough to unwind it. And I find that within myself, having so much information from everyone all the time, if I literally don't take care of myself, my meditation or whatever it is you know like take that time to allow everything that's happened because it's happening so fast now like so fast it's crazy if i don't sit and let it unwind it's stuck and it's not like settled i guess so to speak and so i haven't been able to integrate it into like my body or my whole existence and so it's just kind of like floating on the surface and i haven't just like, oh, yeah, that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and that happened. And then at night I find I can't even go to sleep because my mind's going, oh, that still needs to be processed, or oh, that needs to go there, or oh, da 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 And so being aware of, because it's changing and shifting, being really care or not like cautious or considerate of ourselves and giving us that time to unwind, which most people don't you know their unwinding is like watching tv but they're just yeah they're getting just more information <laughs> not like allowing it to trickle out and so i think that that's the key part to integrating it a little bit easier is actually taking the time to let it wind out of our bodies what about because i'm like super this is a really classic thing that i do all the time where you know i I always think we're always evolving and shifting and changing as people. I don't think anybody is ever stuck or stagnant or regressing or anything like that. I think we're always perpetually moving forward. Mm -hmm. But I'm just like I do this terribly all the time where I don't take the opportunity to really look back and absorb what I've gone through and what I've changed and what I've evolved out of and where I'm at at this point. I always continually perpetually move forward in my own head where I'm always thinking that do you know what I mean? I, can't, I don't give myself the time and the allowance to really look at where I've come, what I've achieved, what I've, um, do you know what I mean? How different my life is today than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. I always think that I'm still stuck in that same place or that I'm, you know, it's going to be better when. And I think that's a really important thing that if, like I said, if everybody had the opportunity to stop and really look at maybe the last six months or the last year of their life and look at it in a very conscious way, not just in a, you know, somebody telling you, well, look at all these things that you've done. You hear it, but it goes in one ear and out mm -hmm. the other. And really having to process to sit and look at those things in a very conscious kind of methodical way where you allow yourself the opportunity to absorb it, I think would do massive things. And then, and then we start mm -hmm. to see and realize how much we've changed and how much we've been able to kind of alter our own reality and lives and existence purely by our intention and thought and all those kind of things. Mm. I find that has been my most powerful tool actually is the the self-reflection or if I'm I'm stuck in like so to speak a pattern I call them patterns when I keep trying to like pass a lesson or pass something and I'm not I just keep failing I go to my because I journaled my whole life so I go to my journals and I'll look back at like what was it like you know, around this time a couple years ago or like even nine years ago because I see like we go on nine-year cycles. Our lifespan, we experience, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the same things over nine years. And uh, I haven't been able to figure that out until I was older and kind of watched a lot of patterns. I've always watched a lot of things in my life to see how that plays out and going back and going like, oh, wow, I'm having this like whole thing this theme of these nine years that i've been going down and learned many different parts of it you know and then do you think that's specific to you or do you think everybody in general kind of goes through a nine-year cycle throughout i think their it's life? everyone in general um in numerology 
when you add up the year, our year, this year is a one, and it goes one to nine, and then one to nine over and over and over again, which, um, funny enough, you know, we, when females have a baby, we, we have them in our, in our body for nine months. And so I think about our life cycles as the same. It was like birth and, and then, uh, like the birth and rebirth process is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. The birth and death process is in nine year cycles of cycles we go through our life. So it's like the last, the last two years, um, for everyone was a lot about like that last two months of trying to get a baby out. It's really hard and uncomfortable. And like, there's a lot of things that you're trying to get out and there's lots of things that get just stuck in fears and like going over all these things. And so a lot of the times in the nine year cycle, the eight and nine years are always the hardest, hardest years of those cycles. And this one being a one year, it's like we get to remap what, what we want. We always can do that, but there's something like energetically more powerful about this one year being creating a new way of, of your cycle, you know, like, Oh, this is what I, this is more what I want to project or this is more what I want to see of like, I really want to succeed and I really want to follow my, my heart's passion or whatever it might be. You know, this has been the year that a lot of people have been coming and being like, I'm really done with this like traditional job thing and I don't know what to do. And I really like, I can see it energetically that people are re coming like re or rebirthing into something new that they've wanted to experience, but maybe had some fear of, or, I guess waking up to whatever's <laughs> going on or waking up to what they're really feeling, you know, yeah. not like living in the belief structure. They're like, well, I'm not happy in, in this way anymore. And, um, <clears throat> I've never heard of that. I mean, it makes perfect sense the way you're describing it and the way you're talking about it. And for whatever, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know why I've never heard that before. Or ever thought about it that way, but the whole nine and, the way that the numerology works with we go from one to nine and then it just repeats and then being, uh, you know, labor, not labor, uh, pregnancy and the whole thing. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. And so, so as you're talking, I'm sitting here going through my life, nine, 18, 27, 35, <laughs> I just turned 36. So I'm, so I get an exciting next nine years. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing. Um, the study of numerology and astrology and, all of the different studies that I've done, they're all just ways of kind of understanding ourselves or describing ourselves, and but it all correlates. I've found, like, even the Bible, there's the 12 disciples. Those are our 12 archetypes. Those are our 12 astrology signs. There's, like, so many things that fit into 12s in that way, too. And everything really... Like, I can see the connection in everything, every religion, every everything. There's lots of variances, and they call things different, but it's all the same. It's all just ways of describing ourselves and trying to figure out what the fuck we're doing here and why we are the way we are over time, you know? <laughs> it's the same thing, too, I think, with, like, spirituality and all the concepts and ideas mm-hmm. and crystals and chakras and all these type of different things. I think it's, you know, I totally agree that it's just yeah. a way of trying to make sense of the existence of what is going on and why and how, right? I mean, it's all, it's like you said, it's all the same in the end. Yeah. My favorite thing to think about is like, you know what? We could all be a hundred percent wrong about everything. And that's like the common thing that we share. <laughs> Do you think we are though? I don't know. I think that there's lots of stuff we're wrong about. And I think that the funniest joke would be if we were wrong about everything. It gives me, it just gives me like, I don't think that'd be a funny joke. (laughs) (laughs) And then it's like something even that we couldn't even imagine. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I think that all the time. Like, what if I do just go back to the earth? Like, what if it's just dirt after this? Right. Mm -hmm. I die and that's it. And I think if, you know, if that's it, that's okay. I'm okay with that. I understand the cycle of life and the way that we return to the planet and all these kind of things. And I, but, but it's like, you have to hope for more. You have to want more. Uh, I believe that there's more. I don't think we, you know, our bodies, I think definitely return, but I think that 
more of us continues on and doesn't mm. ever stop and all the interconnected bullshit and stuff. But it would be funny if it wasn't, yeah. if we just went back to earth. Yeah. It's just like, I like to think of all the options, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or all that I can try and think of. But... Yeah. Hey, what if we're all wrong? You know, <laughs> think of how many times throughout history we have been wrong Yeah, where there's a commonly held, not, not even commonly, but like a definitive held belief in regards to some kind of structure and explanation for something and then the next you know somebody comes out and nope we were wrong this is what it really is and this is how i mean yeah for example the flat world as opposed to the round world that's a pretty big significant belief (laughs) (laughs) and for some reason that's coming back like for some reason people want to bring back the flat earth oh and still have that idea and have you not heard of the whole flat earth theory that the reality is it really is flat oh no (laughs) People get a little crazy on it <laughs> where they want to like come. I mean, there's a big thing right now where people believe that, no, in fact, the earth is flat. Oh. Yeah. I I don't well, okay. get it. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it looks flat right now. As I'm looking out the window, it looks pretty flat. Like, I'm not walking on a curve or anything, so I can see that. Yeah, that's their <laughs> argument, too. Like, look, as far as I could see, the earth is flat. <laughs> yep, oh. You're right. As far as you could see, the earth is flat. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> There is truth in all things. <laughs> Mindy, thank you very, very much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I yeah. really, really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. It's been fun. Great time. It's been cool. Yeah. Give everybody, uh, you're at the Golden Braid, give everybody your contact information so that they can get a hold of you if they want to and the easiest way to do that. Okay. Um, I work at the Golden Braid Thursday through Saturday and... You can um, call and book through there if you want to come in for a reading. I can also give you my contact information if you're into wanting to come to the apothecary, see what I've got. I've got all sorts of teas, tinctures, um, like we talked about, all all different things that your body goes through. I have an idea of how to help you. <laughs> and uh, my phone number is 385-831-8078. And you can give me a call. Uh, I've got a lovely voicemail if you don't get me. It'll give you a little more information. And I think that's about it. I'm not really, I don't have a website right now. I'm still in progress. So Your Facebook though, you've got the um, oh, I do have your Facebook. jewelry and everything like mm-hmm. that that we didn't even get onto. Yeah, I do have Facebook. And so you can look up um, Ruffles and Rocks and it's spelled R-O-X on Facebook and also, um, Amare, which is a M a R E warriors, like, you know, warriors battle (laughs) Amare warriors. And that's another Facebook. And that's more of like my, uh, that we talked about, but the spreading love on the planet is the goal there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. And everybody go out and have a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful day. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We love all your support. And we also have to shout out to EntheoZen. Remember, nutritional solutions for balancing the mind and body. Go check them out at their website, EntheoZen.com. Go do it now. Right now. We all want to help each other and we all want to like be there for each other. And Nature is our connection that's interconnected through every single human and everything here. There's like nine or ten different perspectives you can see anything from. The only thing I've found that we have all in common, 100%, we can't deny. Like, trees are awesome.